this time of confession, I want us to hear the word and then just bow humbly in quiet prayer. Get your heart right with God as before we get ready to preach and teach the word. Psalm 51, it was the great psalm of King David as he went into Bathsheba and uh, he was convicted. God sent Nathan there to confront him. As time passed, I don't know exactly how long it was, but David knew that he needed uh, true forgiveness and repentance and confession of his sins. And there are different kinds of sins we need to confess. Get it right with the Lord. Hear these words and then we'll pause for a moment of quietness. Psalm 51, 10 through 13. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. <coughs> then will I teach transgressors their, thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Let's just bow now humbly here for a few moments. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Um, before we get started, is that, is that fan running constantly? Okay. I thought it should be it's supposed to be on auto there, Dwayne. I, I was just thinking I keep hearing it run. I thought it would just go down. But anyway, that's all right. Romans chapter 8, and I want to update you just a little bit here. We're talking about are you safe and secure tonight. Now, when you get to Romans 8, this is a high mark of the book of Romans. And Brother Paul is dealing here with Christians now. Uh, he's right into the Christians. And they're in Rome, and they're under great persecution. You've you got to realize that when you read scriptures, you need to know some kind of background, what's going on with people, why is he writing this. And it talks there about if you're in the flesh, you're not in the Spirit of God. Like verse 9, we did that way back last year. If the Spirit of God dwell in you. Uh, then he talks about the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead. Verse 11 dwells in you. Mortifying the deeds of the body. Verse 13. For as many as led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So if a person is being led by the evil spirit, that they are not being led by the spirit of God. And I don't know what Bible and what kind of teaching of the gospel they read of Jesus. People say you can... You can trust Jesus and live like you want and disobey the Word of God and uh, not be led by the Holy Spirit. I don't know what Bible they read, but I've got news for them. It ain't the, it's not the Jesus that we teach and preach. It's not the Jesus of the Bible, and it's not the Word of God. Uh, we're, we're still in bondage if that's the way we're going to live and treat God. I, I don't want to blaspheme the name of God and blaspheme, blaspheme mock his holy name. That is, that is an awful thing. And, uh, 
but the Spirit of God teaches us to be the children of God and walk in faith and love for Him and live for Him all through the Scripture. Sure, when you're saved by faith, but you're saved to serve Him and love Him and walk with Him and be led of the Spirit of God. Then he talks about uh, the creature, verse 18, in this present time is not going to be compared with the glory, He's talking about the heaven that's coming one day. Uh, the creation groans, verse 22. You haven't been groaning lately, have you? Anybody been groaning some? As you get older, I was reminded that yesterday I talked to somebody. They said, oh, Don, when you get 25, oh, 25, you start breaking down. I said, oh, Lord, have mercy. I wish I could go back then at 25. I don't think I would break it down much at no 25 now. Uh, but anyway, I knew what she was saying. She was just kidding about it. But hope in verse 24 and 25 in the Spirit uh, helps us in our infirmities. Verse 26, about prayer, the Spirit intercedes for us. Now we come to this great section about being safe and secure. Now I want you to listen carefully. Now we, won't, we probably won't do maybe three parts here tonight. I've got seven major parts in this chapter. But anyway, we'll probably just do about three of them. So I want us to... Um, begin here as we read the Word of God. Romans 8 and 28. I'll read some of these verses. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up. For us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. We'll pause there right now. Christian, are you safe and secure? We have the faithfulness of God our Father, poured out by the grace of God, His undeserved favor and kindness through the love of the Son, Jesus. We have the help and guidance of the Holy Spirit of God at work in us. If you're not a Christian, you're lost. If you're away from Jesus, you're unsafe. And you're, not, you're very insecure. I like what the dear lady said as she got on the, the plane one day. She was an older lady. Uh, she was frightened. And she's walked down the aisle, and there was a businessman sitting there. There was a seat right beside him. He had his briefcase, you know, open and so forth. And uh, she, she sat down there at the aisle. So the first thing she says, she says, sir, do you like to fly? He said, well, yeah, I guess, you know, I guess he probably, he didn't want to talk, probably. He wasn't caring about listening to her. She says, I don't like to fly. She says, I like it when we're safe on the ground. But you know the greatest safety, she said to him then? To know that I am safe in the arms of Jesus. That's a testimony, isn't it? Uh, I wonder if he wanted to get up and walk away. He didn't say what he did, but I wonder what he did. Did he speak to her anymore or just closed up? Are you safe in the arms of Jesus. Let's say, first of all, tonight we're safe and secure because God is working for our good. Now, listen carefully. You've got to listen to these phrases that I say. I did not say God says everything is good. That's not what he said. It's about the teaching of the Word does not say. We know that in all things, 
in the scope of God's work. Few things, some things, many things. No, he says God is working in all areas of his children's lives. Good times, bad. Dark and light. Sweet and bitter, easy, hard, happy, sad, prosperity and poverty, health and sickness. Family, finances, jobs, the nation, the world, the church. He's at work. Jesus said, I'll build my church. A pastor, I, I have a hard time. Somebody says, you know, they founded the church. You ever seen that? And I know what they mean. You know what they mean. I hope people know what they mean. Just because Don Page went down to another place in Alaska, say, and we started helping start a church. Well, you can say he helped start the church, sure. But Jesus said, I built the church. He does. He said, I'll build my church. So always remember that. He's at work in the church. Now, the Roman Christians, now remember, they're in the power seat of the emperor of Rome. The Roman Empire rules all the known world at that time. They were, they were, they're mean. They were rough. People talking about having a rough today. I hate to be even walking by some of those guys in those Roman armies. Suffering. Persecution. And oh boy, the, a lot of the emperors, they hated the Christians. They thought there was cult and weird things they did and all this. You know, they stir up all kinds of things, just like today. They make up things. But even... Brother Paul says, even in your times of persecution, God's at work. He wants to work out things for the good of your lives. Even if it's the ultimate good. Really, I'm thinking he's pointing me also saying to think about the ultimate good is the glory of heaven to be with the, with the Lord forever and ever. But right now, he's working. Everything that happens is good. That's false statement. That's not what he said. Disasters. You take an earthquake, a tornado. That's not, that's not a good thing. That's devastating. I don't know if you've lived through a tornado or whatever, or an earthquake. I don't want to live through it. I haven't. I mean, we're close to, you know, bad storms and winds and all like that, and we've had things close to that. And there's hurricanes and all. Those are bad things. Disease, murder, hatred. We, we live in an evil, fallen world, a broken world. That's where sin began, in the garden. You know where the first murder was? Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel. Cain killed Abel right there. Chapter 4, the first murder. First family. All things are working for good. God is, is causing everything to work together for good. To those who love him. Watch it. Those who love him. You love the son? You love God through his son? You recognized him? Realized your sin? Received him as Lord and Savior? You abide in him? Faith. Trust in him. Throughout Bible history. Look for a moment. Joseph. If you were young Joseph in Genesis, you know he had the coat of many colors. Jacob made the beautiful coat for him. He loved him. He's the precious son of Rachel. Uh, the wonderful boy. Well, he's talking about dreaming and all these things. And the boy said, we, we're sick of him. He's a prized son. I don't want to have him around. Get rid of him. Hated by brothers, sold as a slave, lied about, put in prison, forgotten, disappointed, suffered greatly. God raised him to number two in the nation of Egypt. And one day he looked at his brothers. You can see it, Genesis 50, 20. If you, don't have, if you have a pen there to mark this, Genesis 25, I mean 50, verse 20. You meant evil against me. 
But God, but God, meant it for what? The good, good. To save many lives, save the people, save the nation, and save, saved Egypt. They all died and starved. But God used him. It looked bad. God said, I'll raise it for your good and the glory of God. Paul, you know what? In 2 Corinthians 11 and 12, if you haven't read that chapter, it really starts about 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. He goes through all these things. Persecutions, shipwrecks, imprisonments, illness, beatings. And people tell you to taste, oh, if you're a Christian, everything is going to be just fine. You're going to have perfect health, perfect wealth. Who said that? I see, I don't know what Bible people read. I don't know what Savior they serve. Just look in the life of Jesus. Go to the Gospels. Look at Jesus. And then look at Brother Paul through his letters. All these difficulties of suffering. He says, I believe God somehow... His grace is sufficient for me. My grace is sufficient. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and following. That's talking about thorn in the flesh. We don't know what he was. He's had some physical problem. He may have had several physical problems. So his grace is going to match up. It's going to work it out. Here he goes. What does the Bible say? Verse 28. Work together for good to them that love God to them who are the called. Who's called? According to his purpose. Look, look with me, what you in the Bible. We want to look together. I don't want you to miss this. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I told you the, the church in Corinth was rough. The other rough church. First Corinthians 1, verse 23 and 24. Three kinds of people described in the world even today. Now watch it. 23. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews, a stumbling block. All right, Jews. Jews do what? They trust in their religion, their rites, their rituals and ceremonies, all through the Old Testament. It's a stumbling block to the gospel. So there's the Jews. Now watch this. And the Greeks, uh, Gentiles, seek after wisdom. We are in the Gentile group. Unless you're going to be in part of the next group, which is Christians, and I'll show you. The Greeks or the Gentiles, they trust in their philosophy, the human wisdom. That's what Brother Paul was trying to say. There's so many today trusting in themselves. I trust what I can do. I'm my own man. I can do what I want to. Humanism. Uh, we're in this modern, um, uh, the modernists today. Whatever is true for you is not true for me. You want to do what you want to do, I'll do what I want to do. Everything's okay. No, it's not. There's right and wrong, there's truth, and there's false. Those who are the call. Now watch this. Preach Christ 23, 24. But unto them which are called, called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. They're called in whom? They're called out by Jesus. They're chosen because, because of their religion? Uh-uh. Because of wisdom of man? Nope. Not going to work. They're called by God to look to Jesus. Go to the cross. He said, we preach the cross, the resurrection. What are you doing about it? Are you convicted? Have you heard it? How are you responding to it? Are you coming out of the darkness? 
out of your own self and selfish sin and pride, and you're turning to Christ at the cross. That's what he's trying to say to them. You believe he died, rose again, he took your place? Watch this beautiful verse. This is part of the doctrine of election. 2 Tim 1.9 calls us out. Watch this. 2 Tim 1.9. Who has saved us and called us. How? With a holy calling. Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. It was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. 2 Tim 1.9. All things are working together for good to those who are called according to his purpose. Story told an elderly ministry. He had a, he had a bookmark made for him one time. It's beautiful silk on the white side. And it had a beautiful motto. But underneath there's this tapestry. And he went to see this man who was dying. He was very sickly. He ministered to him. And it came to his mind. He said, look at the, the bottom of this um, special little design. This tapestry. Well, he said, that looks bad. I mean, he said, oh, naughty. You've seen the underside of threads and all, clippings of threads and all. Now, he said, turn it over. And on that beautiful white silk, three words, God is love. He just blessed that man. He just lifted him up, you see. He, he's trying to say that the circumstances of life and death, it's like tangle patterns. Ponder your own life. I, I wanted to go here tonight and take a little time to look over my life, but you, you know nothing, enough about my life. You don't want to hear all the things about my life. But you go back home tonight or sometime this week and go over things like when you're a little child. And then as you went to school, uh, as, you, as you worked in places of work, maybe even as a teenager, and then those who are going off to college. You see what I'm saying? You go through the pictures of your life. You don't get to go through every day of your life. Not, I'm not saying that. But I'm saying you ponder how God is working together for good. Those who love him are called according to his purpose. You see that? It'll bless your life. We're safe and secure. Because we're right with God through his son Jesus. Now, secondly, let's move along here. Verses 28 and 20, I mean 29 and 30. God's going to make us like Jesus. Now watch the wordings. How's he going to make us? More like Jesus. That's his plan for every life. You believe God has a perfect plan? His purpose, we said, is for our good but his glory. You see. His glory. It started in eternity past. He chose us in Christ, Ephesians 1. Verse 29 said, God foreknew. Let me ask you. We talk about God as three things. He is omnipotent. What is that? All powerful. He is omnipresent. What's that mean? All present. He is omniscience. Omniscient, all knowing. Aren't you glad that God knows all about you? Aren't you glad? He's a great God. In eternity past, He knew us. He said, I've also predestined you to mark out to a point determined beforehand. Don't you think that God knows that we would come to Him? How is it? Watch this. How is it? I went to this man three times a few years ago. Three times. At, I'm talking about a different times. It could have been in three different sets. Six months later. Could have been a year or six months after that. I said to the music ministry at that time. That's not here. There's another place. He said, oh, preacher, we, I've dealt with him three times myself within a, a year's time. And another deacon worked with him years before that. He said he's not ready. He's not ready. He's, he lives in darkness. He's lost his mind. He's blinded. 
by the God of this world, you see. But God knew somewhere down the road that he would come to him. God knew that. I didn't know it. John didn't know it. Bill wouldn't know it. But he did years later. Just a few years ago, I guess, before he died. I'm not quite sure what year it was. But I was thankful to hear that he did turn to Jesus. The Spirit of God came powerful in his life. But God knows that. That's it. Foreknowledge of God. And he wants us to make us like his son. He destined us. This is our end, friends, to be like Jesus. See that? Conform to the image of his son. What a beautiful thing that is. That that ought to make you secure in Jesus tonight. As his follower. Now, people talk about God's election, predestination. Don't miss it. It's in It's in the scripture. But he doesn't operate apart from your responsibility in mind to trust Jesus. He's done everything he can for us. He puts him out. He put Jesus at the cross. So look to the cross. Look with me for a moment in John's gospel. You know that great chapter, John 3. God so loved the world. Verse 16. There's a lot. That, that is a great passage on a whole salvation, true salvation. He gave his son. That's grace. He gave Jesus. You believe in him. He's drawing us to him. John 6, says, unless a father draws you to him, to Jesus. See, I can't draw you. I can tell you, but I can't draw you to, to the son. Look at verse 18. He that believes on him is not condemned. We're not judged. But he that believeth not, he's condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. 19, this is the condemnation. This is the judgment. Watch it. That light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than the light. Lest his deeds should be reproved. Verse 36 at the very end. He that believes on the Son has everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. The Lord knows that. But he's predestined his own to come to him so that one day we can be conformed to the image, likeness of his Son, Jesus. It's a glorious thought, isn't it? Our safety, our security is in him. Don't forget it. In whom he predestined, he called. That's sort of our calling again. Calling us out. Let me, let me share you something with you. How in the world a boy growing up on the farm, played ball in high school, played in the band, loved science, went to college for three years studying science. And then that day I walked across campus. It's like the Lord said. I didn't hear him audibly. I mean, his spirit with my young spirit. It's time to make this decision. To follow me as Lord of your life, true Lord of your life. I trust him as Savior, Lord. But I wasn't following him. He said, I got a plan for you. You switch from science to ministry. Now, who did that? I fought it for, for different times, some different years. Somebody said to me like seventh, eighth grade, said, one day you're going to be, would you be a minister of the gospel? I said, well, I want to serve Jesus, but I don't know about being a pastor. I didn't even thought about that. That's like seventh, eighth, ninth grade. I can remember that young man now. It's strange, isn't it? Who could do that? It's only a work of God. You see? He called he called it justified. We're going to talk more about justified in the, in the fifth section here, but it's a picture of the court. You see, folks, when we stand before, that's a, this is a great testimony to share with people. When you stand before the court and the judge is the Father God and he looks down at you and he says, why should I let you into heaven? What are you going to say? Well, I did this. I went to church. I did these things. Well, it's a great things. But who's going to defend you? 
you better have Jesus. You see, he's the only one who can justify. Christ would be the justifier. He died. He took your place and mine. What a, what a glorious, wonderful safety and security there is in Jesus. Then he justified us. He will glorify us. This is a future glory of going to heaven one day. I don't want you to forget about sanctification, but that's not in this part. Of, Paul already talked about some of sanctification back in chapters 5 and 6 and so forth in Romans. Sanctified being set apart now to live for Jesus. Are you living for Jesus in your daily walk of life? See, when God saves you, he calls you, you trust him, he justifies you, and one day in the end he's going to glorify us. He will see us through. And so I want you to write down this tonight. We're just going to do these two parts tonight, first and second part. Write down John 10, and you go back over that Good Shepherd chapter this week. Would you do it? And see if you belong to Jesus. Are you listening to his voice? If you belong to Jesus, you know what's going to happen, don't you? You're going to follow him. I'll talk to people. If I talk to them this week, I said, don't just tell me that you believe Jesus, that he died on a cross, rose again. I want to know, are you going to follow Jesus? Jesus said, are you going to come after me? If you're going to follow me, take up your cross and follow me. Can you do it? All right. He's going to make us like Jesus one day. Are you trusting him? Do you love him? Let's bow our heads in humble prayer here, okay?